So Lynn, at the time of Jesus, what was the Roman Empire like? Well, the empire was uh, huge. It, it covered almost uh, around the Mediterranean. Um, it was powerful, very powerful. It was impressive. The army was impressive and they built a lot of roads to manage the troops. Uh, There's a lot of trade. Um, all of that can sound positive. Uh, there was a single language that was spoken, a single coinage. Um, all of that facilitated travel and people going lots of places, kind of like today in the modern West, people traveled a lot. They didn't just stay in, in one town. All of that, I think, helped the gospel spread. But there was a downside also. Uh, I could point to at least two things. First of all, the Romans were ruthless. They were known for being ruthless. Uh, one of their own historians talks about, his name is Tacitus, and he talks about how he quotes from a, what, a, a chieftain in what now is Scotland, uh, who lamented that the Romans make a desert and they call it peace. And uh, so they devastated uh, the land and people, people knew that. So they, they were a frightening force, not really a force for peace in the way that we think of it. And then secondly, the culture was highly stratified. So everyone had their own little ladder, rung of the ladder. Um, and, and what that meant was you felt your own self-worth based on what other people said about you. And I think the power of the gospel was that each individual was beloved of God, right? As, as both Paul and Peter will say in the New Testament, God shows no favoritism. That you would not hear from a Roman. Jesus was referred to as a Messiah. What, what, would that, what did that mean? What did the term Messiah mean? Well, the term Messiah is a Jewish term. So you're not gonna have something like that for the Romans. Um, it a, it's, means the Lord's anointed. Um, so the, the Jews, in their scriptures talk about this Messiah figure, this anointed one who will be king, but also a righteous king, right? Who will lead the people um, in goodness. Uh, the Jews in Jesus's day also thought that maybe the Messiah would overthrow Rome and kick Rome out, or that the Messiah would go into the temple and purify it. Uh, so those were the expectations that, that existed at that time. Were there many other people who claimed to be messiahs? Yes, as it turns out, uh, there were a few. In fact, we know some even thought maybe John the Baptist was yeah. because he was preaching uh, a holiness and uh, come, a return to God uh, with the fervor that people expected the Messiah to have. But there were others, and uh, we know of them from one of the Jewish historians at the day uh, called Josephus. He talks about a couple of men who uh, wanted to be king in, in kind of that messianic way. Uh, they were often, as Josephus describes them, they're tall, powerful warriors, ruthless. Uh, he, yeah, so that, that's kind of how he's describing them. How, did you, how was Jesus marked out as different from, say, the other Messiah figures? Yeah, well, I think uh, people were not impressed with his uh, prowess in any kind of military might. We don't uh, can't imagine him being uh, tall and strong and celebrity-like, that's not at all. Um, but he was a healer. And I think that's what drew so many people, his healing and then also his miracles. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, you know, we have a, a, perhaps a, a, an allusion there to Moses feeding his people. Uh, and so I think people were drawn to Jesus' teachings for sure, but then the actions that supported his teachings. What was it about Jesus' teaching that made him stand out? I think he had uh, compassion. Uh, people seemed to really be drawn to him, uh, and I think it was because he could focus on them. Uh, he certainly knew scripture, uh, but he was able to understand the, the spiritual side of scripture. Um, he, he followed kosher laws. It wasn't like he was a lawbreaker in, in that sort of sense. I think he just was able to capture the essence of, of the law for everyone. I think the, the average person thought, this is, this is a guy who, uh, who knows me, who understands me. And they were eager to, uh, to see what it was about him that I, I think he had a joy. And, uh, and, and I think that's what drew people to then ask him further questions. When you think about Jesus as a Messiah figure in the Roman Empire, tell us about the cross because that doesn't seem to fit, does it? 
not at all. Uh, in fact, it's, it's a scandal, right? Uh, and, and it was hard to, to understand. Paul will talk about that in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 first, uh, first Corinthians, how people just didn't get it. I, the, the cross, to die on the cross was not simply painful physically, but it was shameful. And in the culture of the day, shame was to be avoided at, at, as much as you could. Um, and you were hung uh, without clothing on. Um, you were there just, uh, yeah, just, just exposed. Uh, and it was a long, slow death. So it, it was a way to terrorize. I guess I could put it that way. It was a real terror. And uh, we, we know the Romans had that in mind because they would put the crosses along the roads where people would see it. Wow. So why the cross then? The, the cross for uh, Christ was his way of sacrificing his own life uh, for the sins of the world. Uh, the book of Hebrews talks about how Jesus is both our high priest, but also the sacrifice. It's kind of an interesting way, uh, he's both. Uh, and that sacrifice is for the forgiveness of sin. And so that, that's the essence, I think, of the, of the cross. It, it's a bit like seeing the cross as a, as a transaction, a physical transaction. Is that how you would see it? Well, I think that it, uh, it certainly is talked about as that by which God forgives our sins. Um, that we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This would be in Ephesians chapter 1. So, yes, I think there is, there is that. However, I think Jesus in his um, call to the disciples to take up their cross and follow after him. And this is, of course, before he dies on the cross. I mean, it, it, it's kind of interesting. I wonder exactly how they would have understood that because yeah. uh, we see it in hindsight now. Um, but I think what he was, uh, was getting at there is the nature of discipleship is one of self-sacrifice, one of service of others, um, and obviously service then to God. And it wasn't just the death, but obviously the resurrection. Absolutely, yes. The, the death is that atonement piece, um, but it's nothing without the resurrection. It's the resurrection that validates that God has in fact accepted uh, the sacrifice. And so Paul will say again to the Corinthians, this is at the end of the letter, you know, that if, if Jesus is not raised, then we're still in our sins. And, and we're pitiful, you know, because we're believing a lie. Today in a modern era, we kind of think, oh gosh, who could believe a resurrection? But it wasn't easy to believe then either, was it? No, it wasn't. Uh, most people thought that uh, they, they continued in some way after death, um, but it was terrifying to think about. They didn't have any assurance. Some of the philosophers thought that their soul would reanimate or would continue in some particular way, but not the body. Uh, the, bod the bodily resurrection though for Paul is so important because it does confirm that our sins are forgiven, but it also speaks to the new heavens and the new earth, right? That God will make all things new, that God as the creator God is not defeated by sin. Yeah, following the resurrection, a relatively small group of people became very animated about Jesus. What changed? There was a power that, uh, and, and perhaps it was in part that they saw the fulfillment of what Jesus has said would happen. Um, they also were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and that gave them a joy uh, that was supernatural. Uh, and I think both men and women uh, had this uh, sense that th there was a purpose, right? And that the, the Lord was busy fulfilling the promises. Is it, does it surprise you that the church continues to do mission? I mean, here we are 2,000 years later, we're sitting in Denver, we're talking about the mission of Jesus, and it's still happening and it's never stopped. Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me because I think it's woven into the DNA of the gospel. You, when you know that Jesus loves you and your sins are forgiven, you can't help but share it. And so whether that means that you go to a, another country or you learn another language, uh, or you're just talking to your neighbor over the fence in the backyard, uh, there's something compelling about the story that makes you want to share it.